So in Act 2, we'll kind of get into some of the nitty-gritty of some equations. Um, so again, as always, don't worry if uh, you are, something seems confusing or you don't understand all of the details, because the goal here is really just to expose you to some of the, the big-picture ideas. Um, so let's dive into Maxwell's equations. So what are they? Maxwell's equations are a quantitative or mathematical framework that tell us precisely how E, the electric field, and another field that I haven't mentioned much, the magnetic fields, which is written B, um, how those guys change in space and time. So let's try to build up to the mathematics slowly. Let's start with what we said before, something we already know. We said that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. So if I draw these E field arrows that point in the direction a positive charge would move in, they go away from positive charges and toward negative charges. And we'll try to ask, how can we make this statement um, quantitative? How can we assign some numbers to this? Okay, well, as it turns out, there's a tool in vector calculus, a mathematical tool, uh, that does exactly this. It gives you a number, a numerical description to tell you how much an arrow points towards or away from some location, and it's called the divergence. So roughly, I mean, if these arrows are all pointing into a point, here the arrows are converging, so we say the divergence is negative. In this middle picture, the arrows are pointing away. This looks like the electric field for a positive charge. So here it's diverging, so we say the divergence is positive. And in this third picture, we have an equal amount of arrows pointing in as out. Um, so they kind of cancel and the divergence is zero. And I think it's useful to have an analogy in your head where you think about a pool of water. So if you imagine a pool of water and these arrows are telling you which way the water's flowing, the water's moving a little bit, the divergence tells you whether a particular point is a place where water's coming out or a place where water's going in. So I have a little animation from Grant about this. So here are my vectors. Imagine these little dots are pieces of water, little water droplets. And if they follow the uh, arrows, then in this picture, they all move out from the central point. So water is kind of coming out and spreading out of the origin of this picture. So you can imagine that maybe there's like a little spigot or something in the middle that's making the water and it's coming out from there. So this is positive divergence, which is like a source of water. Okay. Um, so this is a very nice picture, and uh, I mean, when I was a high, a high school student and I went to Splash, people showed me a lot of pictures like this, but I became a little bit annoyed because um, I wanted to know, what exactly do you mean by div divergence? Can you give me the precise mathematical definition? Even, even if I don't understand it, just tell me the words, because I, I want to hear the, the real definition. So if you're a stickler like me, um, I will give you a prescription on the next slide that shows you how to calculate divergence. And uh, if you're happy with these pictures, you can zone out for a minute. But here's what I precisely mean by the divergence at a point P. So to calculate the divergence at some point P, maybe my point P is here, what do I do? Step one is I surround the point P by some surface. Here it's this heart, heart-shaped surface. Um, I chop up the surface into patches. So here it's like these little squares are patches, and I've shown three patches, one, two, and three, in particular, for each of those patches, I find the flow of E through the patch. So that really means uh, a particular kind of dot product, if you've, if you've studied vectors, a particular dot product that tells you how much of E is pointing in the direction perpendicular to the surface. So here E is pointing kind of outwards from the surface, so there's some positive uh, flow or flux. In this picture, E is pointing just perpendicular to the surface, so there's no flow through the surface. If this were a water flow, there'd be no water passing the surface because it's just skimming the surface. And over here, there's um, water flowing into the surface, so we call that a negative flux. So for each of these patches, I get a number. And then I just add up all of those flows from all of the patches. I add up all those numbers that I get from these kind of dot product type deals then what I mean by the divergence is a particular limit. I take that total flow from adding up all the patches, I divide by the volume of the surface, and I take the limit as the volume gets very, very small. Um, so two comments about this. Uh, one, I had a very good question in the first section of my splash class asking, does this depend on the shape of the surface? Um, and the answer is no. If you take a sphere or a heart or any surface and take it smaller and smaller and smaller, um, you will always get the same answer for the divergence, which kind of intuitively might make sense because as you're taking the volume of the sky smaller and smaller, uh, for a very small surface, the difference between, say, a heart and a sphere becomes negligible, right? It's uh, to, to some approximation, um, the surfaces are becoming almost identical when they become very, very small because they're only really surrounding one point. Um, but you can prove this more, more rigorously. I'm just not going to do it. 
That's the first comment. The second comment is that if you've taken calculus, this might look like some kind of derivative or difference quotient. It's a limit of a ratio as the top and bottom are going to zero. And indeed, the divergence is a kind of derivative. And you can, you can get a formula for the divergence that just involves adding up some derivatives, um, which is usually how it's presented. But I like this definition because it's um, kind of a more fundamental definition of divergence. But just uh, if, if it interests you, just be aware you can turn this into some derivative formula. Okay, that's the picture for sticklers. So now that we have some rough idea of what the divergence is, we can go back to the physics. So the first Maxwell equation is Gauss's law. Gauss's law tells you that the divergence of E, how much E spreads out or points into a point, um, is this thing called rho, which is the charge density. This is some, some guy which is positive if you're sitting on top of a positive charge and negative if you're sitting on top of a negative charge. So it's rho divided by some number, epsilon naught, the special number we saw in Act 1. So all this is saying is that if I surround some blob of positive charge by a little sphere, then the net divergence, which we remember is kind of the flow through a bunch of patches, when I add up the flow through these patches, that's going to be positive, which makes sense because we already know that these electric field lines should point out and away from a positive charge. This just gives us a, an equation that tells us exactly what we mean by that. Good. Okay. So this tells us about the divergence of the electric field. Um, the next Maxwell equation involves the magnetic field, which I haven't said much about yet. Um, the magnetic field is written B. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how to think about the magnetic field later. But for now, I just want you to think of it as being created by either moving charges or permanent magnets like the one on your fridge. If you have a magnet on your fridge, it kind of has like a, a north pole and a south pole. And there's some magnetic field lines that point from the North Pole to the South Pole, like this. Um, and there's a question in my first section about what property of the magnet makes it have this magnetic fields, and um, it's basically spins. The uh, nuclei making up this, um, this bar magnet, the atoms, have some spins, and a bunch of those spins are kind of aligned in some certain domain, and that net spin, or net magnetization, if you will, gives it this property. Um, but unfortunately, I can't explain too much about what the word spin means um, without telling you about the representation theory of the Lorentz group, which would be very far afield. Um, okay, so the magnetic field is produced either by a refrigerator magnet or a moving charge. If I have a wire and I make charges move through that wire, then there's going to be some magnetic field that goes in circles around the wire. And the fact that this goes in circles around the wire will be important very soon. So that's the magnetic field. It comes from these two things. Okay. Um, so I told you about the divergence of the electric field. Now I tell you there's also a magnetic field, so you should ask, all right, well, what's his divergence? What is the divergence of the magnetic field? And as far as we can tell, it's just zero. Divergence of the magnetic field is exactly zero. So what does that mean? That means if I take a magnet with these magnetic field lines I, I showed you, and I draw a little surface. Here I've made the surface a little big so you can see it, but imagine we take this smaller. Take the surface smaller, and that means the amount of magnetic field lines pointing in has to be the same as the amount pointing out, right? Because the divergence is zero. So you can't have more pointing out than in. That would be positive divergence. That must be true for any surface. Um, so all of these surfaces will have the same amount pointing in as out. So another way to think about this statement is that, well, I can't have a pure north pole, right? If I had a magnet that was a pure north pole, then the magnetic field lines would all point out of it, right? All the magnetic field lines would point out of it, which kind of looks like a positive charge, right? A positive charge has all of these lines, the electric field lines pointing out of it. So a pure north pole would be like a magnetic charge. It looks just like an electric charge, but for the magnetic field. And this equation is telling you that there are no magnetic charges. If you try to make one by taking a magnet with a north and a south, and you try to chop it up to get just a north, it won't work because when you cut it, um, you don't get just a north, you get a north but another south. And then the other magnet, if you chop it into three pieces, for instance, has a north and a south, and this has a north and a south. So you can't get just a north, uh, little north uh, pole or something sitting there that would be like a magnetic charge. Um, I should say that this is kind of our, our experimental understanding. We've never seen a magnetic charge in nature. Um, but in, in theoretical physics, in string theory, and in uh, mathematical physics, uh, there's some modern and very beautiful results that come about if you assume there are magnetic charges. Then there's a particular, what's called electric magnetic duality, uh, 
in Maxwell's equations, which leads to some very deep mathematics. So as a theorist, you might say, okay, I don't want I don't want this to be zero. I want this to be proportional to some rho like a charge density, but for magnetic charges. And that's a very nice thing to think about. But um, as far as we know in real life, in the real world, it's just zero. That's the second Maxwell equation. Okay, so what next? If I tell you the divergence of B is zero, you might say, okay, well, what other data about B could I get? If B has no other divergence, how else could we describe it? Well, as I said, would become important a few slides ago. I said, if you have a line of current, some moving charge, um, the B field, the magnetic field, seems to go in circles around it. So it's a different kind of behavior. Before we had divergence, which is like a positive charge where the electric field's lines all point away from it, they spread out. But for that current, we saw that the magnetic field goes in circles around it. Current kind of spins around it, spins around. So in vector calculus, there's another tool for describing the spinning behavior, as the name might or the picture might suggest. It's called the curl, and it's going to measure how much these arrows spin around some point. Um, so let me kind of give you an analogy. Again, the pool of water analogy is useful. If you imagine a pool of water, and all of your arrows are telling you the direction that the water is moving, then the curl tells you basically how spinny um, the water is at that point, how much it's going in circles. Or more physically, if I dropped a little stick or a little paddle wheel in the fluid and I dropped it here, the curl tells you whether this paddle wheel would start to spin, whether it would start to rotate. And here's another nice animation from Grant. So here's some arrows that are going to be the velocities of our fluid. We're going to look at four particular points. We fill in all of the little parcels of water, and then you ask whether it's spinning. So in this location, this guy is spinning counterclockwise, so we're going to say this is positive curl. Here the water is going clockwise, so we'd say this has negative curl. Here this guy, here the water seems to be going um, also uh, counterclockwise, so we'd say this is positive curl. And here, as far as I could tell in that last one, it looked like the curl was, uh, maybe maybe it's still, it looked like it was zero because I didn't see any parcels, but now I think it's going uh, clockwise a little bit. Yeah, it's going clockwise a little bit around here. So it's just measuring how much spin um, the water is, is spinning around in, in each place. That's the intuitive picture version of the curl. Again, if you're a stickler, you might ask me, how mathematically do you define this? And I'll tell you. So mathematically, if you want to calculate the curl at a point P, so say here's my point P, I have a similar procedure to the divergence. What I first do is surround the point P by a closed loop. Instead of a surface, now it's just a loop, a little curve. I chop up the loop into segments. Here I've shown just one segment. Here's a little segment dr of the loop. At that segment dr, I measure how much of E is pointing along dr, or how much of the vector field whose curl I want is pointing in the same direction as this loop. So in this case, the piece of E that's in the direction of dr is this thing here, which you could figure out if you've taken trigonometry. But it's just the, the part of the vector that's pointing in the direction of the loop. So that's what I call a projection, project. So then I do that at a lot of different places. I chop the whole thing up, and I do that for each of these segments, and I add them up. And that sum I call the flow around the loop. It's the sum of the projections. So I take a ratio of that flow, the sum of the projections, divided by the area of the loop, and then I take the loops smaller and smaller. I take the limit as the loop goes to zero. Now, I'm lying to you a little bit. There's a, a kind of caveat, some fine text here. Technically, the curl is a vector. And here I've just told you the component of the vector which is pointing in this direction, this perpendicular n hat direction. So that's why I put this n hat in here. Um, but if you don't know what that means, then uh, don't sweat it. It's just um, just think about the curl as measuring how much this guy is spinning around. And the number is this ratio when the area gets very small. That's the curl. Um, this picture is a bit complicated, so I want to show one more picture that's saying basically the same thing. Um, so again, if I take a closed loop here, it's going around this little football shape clockwise, and the vectors whose curl I want are these little yellow V guys, then I just chop this guy up into a bunch of little segments, and in each segment I look at the V, I project V, which is to say I ask how much of V is pointing parallel to the curve, which here is like this little piece. Over here, the piece pointing parallel to the curve is this little piece, but it's opposite the curve, so it's kind of negative. Here, the part of B pointing along the curve is this guy, and it's positive because it's in the right direction, and I add up all those little guys. I add up all the pieces, um, which again, if the vector fields were the flow of a fluid, like water or something, then this would tell you how much the fluid is flowing around the curve, the whole curve, when you add this all up. That's the curl. 
Okay, so now with uh, that mathematics out of the way, we can come back to some physics. So we have two more Maxwell equations. The last two tell us about curls. Tell us about the curl of E and the curl of B. The first term I want to focus on is this J. So forget the other terms for the moment. This J is an electric current. So if you have charges moving, like in a wire, when you have the charges moving to, uh, I don't know, power to charge your iPhone or something, you have electric charges moving through your charging wire, that J is non-zero at any location where charges are moving. So this is the term that tells us, in the, that slide a, a few slides ago, if you had a long wire, um, that you get a magnetic field that's kind of curling around the wire. So the magnetic field curls around the wire. Um, so that's, that's the J term. But there's these other terms that involve the time change. So this means if you have a magnetic field which changes in time, that produces a, an electric field. But if you have an electric field changing in time, it produces a magnetic field. And if you've taken calculus by this time change, I really mean something like the derivative, dp dt. But if you haven't taken calculus, just think what I mean is I look at the, the magnetic field arrow, this arrow at one point in time, then I wait a little time later, maybe the arrow has moved a little bit, and I just say, okay, what direction has it moved in? Did it get longer? Did it change direction? How did B change in time? But the important thing is that these changing magnetic fields can make an electric field, a changing electric field can make a magnetic field. And I want to show you two pictures um, of examples of that, just very briefly. Um, so suppose I take a magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole, and I vigorously shake it like this, um, which I can't take seriously because uh, I am immature and I have the mind of an eighth grader. But <laughs> besides that, so if you imagine shaking this thing, uh, the magnetic field is certainly changing in time because you're moving the magnet back and forth. That induces an electric field. An electric field makes charges move. So if there's some electrons sitting in this metal wire, the electrons are going to move around the wire, and you can measure that. If you have a little device here that measures moving electrons, you can actually measure that moving the magnet causes the electrons to move around the loop. That's a case where a changing magnetic field makes an electric field. We can have the other case. So suppose I have uh, two metal plates. So I have two metal plates like this, and I'm going to start piling up charges on the two plates. So I pile up a bunch of positive charges on this plate, and I pile up a bunch of negative charges on this plate. Now, initially, the electric field was zero. There's no electric field because there's no net charge. When I start piling up these charges, well, if I drop the charge between the plates, it wants to run away from the positive charges and go towards the negative charges, if he's a positive charge. So that means the electric field points this way. But that means the electric field is changing in time, right? It started at zero, and now it's non-zero. It's pointing from one plate to the other. And whenever the E field changes in time, you get a magnetic field. In this case, the B is the green arrow pointing in a loop around these plates. And uh, there's another question in my first my first section asking, is this a capacitor? Yes, this is just a, if you've studied capacitors, this is just the statement that charging a capacitor produces a magnetic field, which is quite interesting. All right, we're almost to the punchline. Here's the payoff now. So again, I'm going to skip some details, so don't worry if this doesn't totally make sense, but I just want to tell you kind of a cartoon sketch, a simple, simplified version of what Maxwell did. So don't worry about the details. But what Maxwell basically did is say, look, I'm going to consider empty space. In empty space, there's no charges. The charge density is zero. There's no currents. So the current is zero. So I can combine the Maxwell equations. I basically look back at the Maxwell equations. I look at the equation, which is the curl of E. I can take the curl of both sides of this equation. So I take the curl on the left side and the curl on the right side. On the right side, I can switch the order of curl and time change. So I switch the order. So this is the time change of the curl of B. But I can plug in for the curl of B because I know what that is. If J is zero, the curl of B is some numbers times the time change of E. So the right side becomes minus some number times the time change of the time change of E. Or if you like, if you've taken calculus, the second derivative. So that's this equation. This relates the curl of the curl to the time change of the time change, if you like. And there's a theorem in math that I, I won't prove. You'll prove this if you take a class like 807 at MIT. But if the divergence of a vector field is zero, which, is, which it is in this case because there's no charges, then up to a minus sign, the curl of the curl is related to a special operator called the Laplacian. Laplacian is roughly, again, if you've taken calculus, like a second spatial derivative. So this equation turns into something that tells you the Laplacian, which is how tells you how E is changing in space, kind of, is related to how E is changing in time. 
And uh, you probably won't recognize this equation, but to a mathematician, this is a very famous equation. It's called the wave equation. And I'll explain why in a simplified one-dimensional example. So this is three-dimensional because E lives in three-dimensional space. I'll think of a simplified example just in one dimension. So the wave equation in one dimension, one spatial dimension X, um, it's just an equation that has a class of solutions. All solutions, in fact, of the wave equation are basically moving graphs. So if I take some graph as a function of X, which looks like this, some random curve, it looks like this at time zero, and then I just move the graph to the right at some constant speed. So at some later time t, the graph is over here. It has the same shape, but it's just uniformly moving to the right. That object, that moving graph that depends on both x and t, is a solution to the wave equation. So that's kind of like a traveling wave. That's why we call it the wave equation, because any shape, any waveform, if you like, that just moves with a constant speed, solves this equation. And the upshot is that this special speed, the speed you need to solve the wave equation, in the particular case we wrote down on the previous slide, is exactly 1 over square root mu naught epsilon naught, which is precisely the speed of light, whoops, precisely the speed of light that we saw in Act 1. So although I've skipped some details and not really proven things for you, this can be made rigorous, which gives you a rigorous mathematical proof of this kind of guess we made in Act 1, that these waves-like solutions, these propagating stitches, um, when you nudge a charge, do indeed move at the speed of light, at this exact speed. That's quite remarkable. Okay, that concludes our kind of math-heavy act on Maxwell's equations.